Climate change will impact nearly everyone, and some will be affected more than others. But persuading policymakers and the public to alter behavior to lessen or adapt to climate change requires more than just scientific evidence. You have to have just the right mix of facts, incentives, and cultural insights to be persuasive. Finding this mix is what drives Dr. William James Smith, Jr., lead investigator on the policy decision-making and outreach component of Nevada's National Science Foundation EPSCOR Climate Change Project. Smith and his team are surveying Nevada's key stakeholder groups to learn what they assume, what they know, and what policies they may be willing to support concerning climate change. There's a million reasons why uh, good data and good technology and good projects sort of don't resonate with the communities that they're about sometimes. So what we wanted to do is make sure that we didn't end up with um, a project that uh, produced a lot of outputs at the end of five years, but then at the end of the day, uh, they just sort of went on a shelf and nobody used them. So how do you know what's truly useful to your stakeholders? Well, you need to communicate with them. So we figured, let's get to know the audience. Let's get to know the stakeholders in Nevada really well. The stakeholders in this case include ranchers and farmers, water and energy purveyors, resource managers, and the most vulnerable population in terms of climate change, Nevada's Native American tribes. We're really pleased with the results of the project so far. And the project's not complete, but I think we're off to a good start. You know, we, we're using survey instruments that take, in some cases, 20 to 30 minutes to get through. That's a fairly long time for a survey, yet we're still receiving 26% response rates from groups that you don't normally get the higher response rate from uh, when it comes to issues like climate change, like the rancher farmer communities. Working with the uh, Native American managers, we're up to 56%. The bulk of the survey work was conducted in Nevada's rural areas. One of the important issues in relation to climate change is environmental justice. You know, we're concerned about vulnerable populations in the state and beyond the state, frankly. And you know, I made a promise on behalf of our component to make sure that we had decent geographic coverage across the state uh, in our research, as well as uh, decent demographic coverage, meaning variety that we're not just focusing on the biggest, strongest, uh, dominant groups. So one group that stands out to me as potentially severely impacted by climate change is indigenous people in general, and in Nevada, it's Native American populations. Researchers visited two Native American tribes in Nevada, the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, located 35 miles northeast of Reno, and the Summit Lake Paiute Tribe, north of the Black Rock Desert in northwest Nevada, near the Oregon-California border. One particular group that we've done a lot of work with has been the Summit Lake group. And now Summit Lake is close to the Nevada-Oregon border. And the Summit Lake Tribe really focuses its culture, in a sense its cultural hearth, is its Native American trout, the Lahontan cutthroat trout, which is a threatened species, exists up in that lake, and you can make the argument that it exists there only. So these groups are particularly vulnerable because, you know, if their trout disappears because the lake disappears, then also their, their culture is severely impacted. William Cowan, Natural Resource Department Director for the Summit Lake Paiute Tribe, says a Lahontan trout holds special meaning for the tribe. Summit Lake is home, is one of two lakes within native range for the Lahontan cutthroat trout that still support a self-sustaining population. And Summit Lake is the largest of the two populations. Here we have fish runs that are about a thousand fish per year and greater. When I was a little person, um, the tribe became aware through the Fish and Wildlife Service that we needed to implement a fishing regulation. And beginning around the early 1970s, a regulation was established that stated that harvest limits per adult tribal member was 50 fish per year and per child was 25 per year. Now that the tribe has realized the importance of this fishery and having an intimate role with recovery and conservation of the subspecies, they have restricted harvest down to five per adult member and two per child. Smith and his team traveled to Summit Lake to administer the survey and interview tribal leaders. Most recently, our trip involved going to view the spawning of the Lahontan cutthroat trout. This is a unique opportunity. You pass through some remarkably rugged yet beautiful lands, uh, through traditional lands with multiple uses for them, everything from 
the, the sacred hot springs to traditional areas with traditional medicinal plants. And we, we had an opportunity to go up to the lake and to actually view the spawning and to view indigenous trout fishing methods, which are sort of amazing to view. The purpose of the trip was to share preliminary survey results with members of the Summit Lake Tribal Council. But for Smith and his team, the experience went far beyond a simple sharing of results. We were very privileged to have an opportunity to see this. Um, and in fact, very few people I have aside from the tribe. And I think the reason that we were allowed to attend and see the spawning and see where the trout run up into the hills and then back down to the lake every year and see the fishing methods and, and interview people one-on-one. -on -one. I think the, the reason why there's, there's two reasons. Number one is tribes are legitimately interested and concerned about climate change. And the second reason is I think that it's important for the, the tribes to have a voice and, and perhaps what we're doing here might provide an opportunity for them to share their concerns with the broader public. And so I think this is uh, a an excellent dimension of our work that we're providing a platform for certain groups to have a voice. When we go to see indigenous fishing up at Summit Lake, what we're really witnessing is a way that the tribe keeps its culture healthy and viable. Smith says cultural viability, coupled with strong internal governance, makes it possible for tribes to secure additional resources, either by themselves or with others. But for tribes out in the rural areas of Nevada, this can be challenging. They spend a lot of uh, effort trying to obtain resources. And what you see is um, typical. Uh, there's one person wearing three or four hats, stressed out, doing three or four jobs. You know, I'm, I'm the trout expert, I'm the climate change person, and I'm the you know, land use person, and I'm the dealing with our boundaries with the other communities person. And, and so I guess what I'm saying is they, they've got a tough job spread out over only a few people with limited financial resources. And, and so this makes adaptation to most things more difficult. Misconceptions about the tribes and tribal life in general complicate collaboration and hinder the management of common resources. Smith worries that without a deep and mutual understanding among stakeholders, Nevada will never come to grips with climate change mitigation and adaptation. Climate change is a mass behavior issue. And if you don't have a good grasp of the population, then you won't be able to work with them to make some sort of impact, whether it's mitigation, in other words, reducing greenhouse gases, or adaptation, which is the impacts are upon us, what shall we do? Because climate change integrates resources across time and space, building support for effective policies and developing capacity for unique groups involves mutual understanding and a willingness to work together. In the case of Native Americans, past prosecutions and misguided natural resource management by the government have created complex barriers to collaboration, even on issues like climate change, where there is considerable common interest. People seem to view Indians as only something of the past, that because people like me have gone on not only to get a college degree and then a law degree, uh, that uh, somehow we've moved on or become assimilated, and we haven't. We are still Northern Paiutes first, or Nima, which is uh, human beings in our own language. We're not part of the mainstream society. I think that um, when you look at the history of the um, laws and regulations that have been passed, um, when you look at the, the water flows, water rights, um, land acquisition, I think that that's something that's always evolving. And I feel that um, laws that were enacted um, by the United States and the state, um, state of Nevada have, have not always been in the best interest of the tribe. What I would like to see is probably more protection of our water um, maybe the lake, we, we do have a, a pretty good sized lake and uh, I think I'd like to see more protection of that and uh, as, you, as you notice, if you look around, um, we're in a we're, we're, uh, pretty high elevation but we're also sitting in a bowl and so you see the surrounding mountains, um, everything that runs off the mountains comes into the lake so um, if you have some pollution, uh, say some diesel spill, um, or anything, it's going to end up here. 23 miles north of the Summit Lake Reservation here, uh, there's a new geothermal project on McGee Mountain where they plan to drill uh, 11 test wells to see if the water is hot enough. And then if they don't find uh, hot enough water, then BLM is going to give them permission to drill in additional locations. Uh, about 
uh, 40 miles southwest or southeast of the reservation. We're dealing with the San Francisco, Oakland, Bay Area communities who want to be green by dumping their waste and garbage in the tribe's territory, uh, which is out in the desert, which they view as a uh, wasteland, but uh, which is a place that we still uh, practice our ceremonies and go to places that are historically important to us and we use them on a regular basis. Native American tribes are impacted by external development that goes on around them. A Ruby Pipeline is an example development project that frustrated uh, POT tribal members over the past year. And the report that uh, building the pipeline had a cultural and environmental impacts. For example, a disturbing of sage grouse nesting sites, plastic uh, trash being left on the ground, and uh, petroleum products uh, being left to soak into the ground in the watershed. Preserving historically significant areas, managing natural resources, and educating federal and state agencies about the proper way to consult with tribal leaders typically require financial resources that some tribes just don't have. Smith says he hopes his part of the Nevada Climate Change Grant will help the tribe secure the funding they need to evaluate the potential impacts of climate change on the Summit Lake environment. They're always looking for opportunities, for example, tribal grants. And so more data and information gives them an opportunity to maybe build a case for another grant to support their natural resource management better. Whether that's with us as partners, whether it's with individuals that they're already working with elsewhere, or by themselves. In either case, I'm happy enough for them if they can find this as some use to their, their tribe. DRI postdoctoral fellows Dr. Carletta Chief and Mahesh Gautam worked extensively with tribal members, county engineers, and natural resource managers to develop an in-depth profile of the Pyramid Lake tribe and its potential vulnerabilities under climate change. The scope and purpose of the research is to understand the resiliency of tribal communities to climate change impacts. Declines in lake levels created by human impacts on Truckee River flows are devastating to the tribe, a point other Truckee River users may fail to consider when negotiating water conflicts. We are meeting with uh, many stakeholders, tribal, non-tribal, and one-to-one uh, uh, in, -one in depth um, open uh, discussions with them trying to understand their perception and uh, their opinions on different aspects of uh, uh, conflict, negotiations. Funded by an EPSCOR seed grant, Chief and her team created two documents, one that systematically describes the vulnerabilities of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe, and a second that identifies what governments and agencies can do to help the tribe build capacity to address climate change issues. Graduate research assistant and master's degree student Kirsten Wild provided additional perspective with her analysis of the Truckee River Operating Agreement, or TROA. Signed in 2008 after two decades of negotiation among key stakeholders, the agreement manages water storage in California reservoirs and flows into the Truckee River. The need for such an agreement became apparent when the Newland Project began diverting water from the Truckee River to the Truckee Canal in 1906. Wilde looked at the role of key stakeholders in forging the document and at the influence and power wielded by the tribe to secure their water rights. I think the most surprising thing that I learned was that there, there are no bad guys, that every stakeholder really has a legitimate need and want, and it is um, very, very difficult within the framework of water policies to meet all of those needs. Dr. Ahmad Safi surveyed farmers and ranchers in rural parts of the state to elicit their perceptions of climate change. What we have seen from uh, that research that uh, ranchers and farmers believe that there's a climate change because they they see it in, in their everyday life, being out there uh, doing their day-to-day -day activity either uh, and either growing crops or uh, taking care of domestic animals, but they, th they see it as a natural process, as part of the natural cycle of, of Nevada climate or 
even of the global climate. Safi says only a small percentage of Nevada ranchers regard climate change as a serious issue, and most are unwilling to pay higher taxes or use more energy-saving vehicles to mitigate the effects of climate change. When it comes to policy actions, the only policy, policy action that they are really supportive of is uh, developing renewable energy resources, which is about 70% of them are uh, f uh, in favor of this uh, policy action. But then we don't have any majority of them supporting any other policy action. And of course, the least, the least uh, preferred uh, among ranchers and farmers is taxation policies. For example, 2.5% only of them support taxing citizens to mitigate climate change. So what we see here is, the fa is that they are ready to do some what they call common sense action that sa save them money now and help the cause of climate change, but they are not willing to, uh, to, to, uh, to pay high price to mitigate the climate change. Improving the education outputs from a, a sound science perspective uh, may not have nearly the impact that we would guess it would. So just making better educational material may not be the way to reach certain groups. Uh, and his uh, studying of some uh, conservative rural groups, what he found is actually what seems to matter is the messenger. So it's not just the message, and it may not even be the message beyond a certain uh, base level of understanding of climate change, of course. It may, in fact, be the messenger. So maybe building bridges to the right messengers might be just as important as producing better educational materials. When we were helping develop the survey, I had an opportunity to talk to quite a few tribal members of this tribe and other tribes. Uh, and the feeling was is that people's observations of insects, animals, uh, rainfall, uh, temperature, and things uh, are valid points that need to be communicated. Uh, of course, there is a trust uh, that has to be developed uh, between the tribal members who wanted to communicate this information and the researchers that want to collect it, because in the past there have been violations of that trust relationship to where information that was gathered for one purpose was used for a totally different purpose and actually harmed the tribes and their members. We're all in this together uh, forming an uh, integrated or holistic project, which is using multiple disciplines to get at the issue of climate change in Nevada. And w although it's difficult to predict what people will do with what you give them, I think that the chances to make informed decisions are, are, are really enhanced if you can provide specific data and information about the state, its stakeholders, their behavior, their policy preferences, for example, what um, adaptation may they be willing to pay for and what may they not be willing to pay for. What's the policies that they support? What policies may they not support? There's value in that sort of um, planning for the future. But there's also value in having a baseline, too, because this baseline data means that now if we come back and ask similar questions or the same questions 10, 20, 30 years from now, we'll see how things are changing in the state, both uh, socially and then in terms of the physical variables, we'll see how the physical changes occur as well. So when you do research, there's a reason to do it that's sort of present tense. At the same time, you know, we have to have a long-term view of the earth and its sustainability in our state and our behavior within the state. For more information on climate change and indigenous people, please contact Dr. William James Smith, Jr.